Well, welcome everyone to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 12, verses 22 through 29. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we praise your name. <clears throat> we thank you, God, for your salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your death on the cross. We thank you, God, for your scripture. We thank you, Lord, for the ability to interpret it. We pray that we do so rightly. Lord, we praise your name for all of the blessings you give, and we praise your name in the midst of any trials and tribulations we endure. Lord, we thank you for all these things. You are the sovereign, holy one. In your name we pray. Amen. And now let's move to the reading of the scripture. Matthew 12, 22 through 29. Then a demon-possessed man, who was blind and unable to speak, was brought to him. He healed him so that the man could both speak and see. And all the crowds were astounded and said, Perhaps this is the son of David. When the Pharisees heard this, they said, The man drives out demons only by Beelzebub, <clears throat> the ruler of demons. Knowing their thoughts, he told them, Every kingdom divided against itself is headed for destruction, and no city or house divided against itself will stand. If Satan drives out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? And if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, who is it your sons drive them out by? For this reason they will be your judges. If I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come to you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man? Then he can rob his house. Now, I'd like to argue that the main idea of this passage is as follows. These verses teach that Pharisees could not formulate a proper argument against Jesus. Thus, they simply accused him of being demon-possessed. Jesus defeated their argument and declared both his messiahship and the kingdom of God. Now, let's move to the exegetical portion of the sermon. So, in verse 22, we see that even though Jesus in the prior verses was being harassed by the Jewish leadership, people were still seeking him out. Okay, so people are still seeking about to be healed or to hear him. In this instance, uh, there was a blind and mute man who was brought to Jesus, and this was linked with demon possession. The demon was causing these things. And it was just a simple response. Jesus healed him. Okay, this also implies, though it's not stated, that the demon was cast out. I mean, it would make sense. I think that's a good assumption here. In verse 23, the crowds were typically, as is normal, astounded or amazed. In other words, they're never used to seeing things like this. But there was this immediate association of Jesus with the title, the Son of David. <clears throat> now, the problem with reading this verse, uh, and again, in this translation it says, perhaps this is the Son of David, is that it, it omits something in the Greek that's kind of important to understand the inflection with which this was asked. So this statement is introduced with the particle meti, uh, which is used in questions expressed expecting a negative answer. In other words, <clears throat> there is a hesitancy on the part of these observers who witness these things to accept Jesus as the Messiah. So this is an expression of doubt, and this is going to make more sense now when we see what the Pharisees do. So why do they express doubt? Well, it's probably due to the lack of Jesus attacking, for example, the pagan Romans, uh, and instead choosing to attack the religion of Israel. So, you know, they, when they, the Messiah came, they weren't expecting him to dethrone the religious system of Israel, they were expecting him to dethrone Roman rule. And again, this false expectation leads to confusion, and this is a very common thing. When we have false understandings, false expectations, false beliefs about God or Jesus or the Holy Spirit, it leads to confusion, it leads to frustration, it leads to disappointment, anxiety, etc. Uh, because we don't know what we can rely on. <clears throat> this is why our understanding of God has to come from the Word of God alone. And through demonstrating that Isaiah 35, five types of works, and you have the healings, the miracles, the demons being cast out, the blind being healed, etc. He was not demonstrating the glorious kingdom power over the nation's enemies. So what we're not seeing is the sort of subjugation of the world's governments under the one government of the Messiah. So how did the Pharisees respond? Well, note, when the Pharisees heard this, what did they hear? Perhaps the son of David. So they're seeing this hesitancy in the crowd. They're seeing this sort of confusion in the crowd. They're going to latch on to that, and they're going to try to use this as an opportunity to drive the wedge between Jesus and the people. At this point, they couldn't do it simply by catching Jesus doing something wrong. They had tried multiple times and always have failed. So now they're just going to play off of the emotional fear or emotional 
confusion of the people and see if that works. And so the Pharisees respond to the crowd and they're not going to go with an argument, they're going to go with an accusation. So what do they say? They, they attempt to try to explain the miracle. So they can't deny that a miracle occurred. They can't even deny his power. I mean, this is the crazy thing. They're watching just crazy miracles and signs. You know, they ask, oh, show us a sign, show us a sign. And it's like, well, guys, you, you've had it and you've denied it point after point after point. You know, this gets into people in the modern day saying, well, if a miracle is done in front of you, would you worship God? And they say, no. If Jesus came back right now, would you worship him? They say, no. It's the hardest of the human heart at work here. So what they're going to do is they're going to go back to their source issue. Where are you from? Who sent you? And they're going to say, no, you weren't sent of God. You were sent of Beelzebul or the devil. Okay. And so they're going to credit the ruler of demons, Satan himself, with the healing and the release from demonic possession that was brought about by the Holy Spirit. And the Messiah. So, you know, it's kind of crazy. They're literally accrediting God's works to the devil. Now, Jesus is then going to say, or well, he's going to think, if you are, uh, Matthew responds saying, knowing their thoughts. This doesn't mean mind reading uh, necessarily, if that's not what's getting it here. He just knows their thoughts. He knows these people. He knows what, what they're trying to do. Okay. Could be that the Spirit told him something, but, uh, you know, they're trying to kill him. He knows their thoughts. So, what does he then do? Well, he is not going to respond with a denial. He's not going to say, no, you're wrong. He's going to use intelligence and wisdom. He's going to use the Holy Spirit here. Uh, he's going to rely on the Holy Spirit here. And he's going to show how their explanation was illogical and actually blasphemous. Because remember, they're crediting God's works to Satan. That's blasphemy. And so he's going to demonstrate this fallacious reasoning. How? So he starts out by saying any or, or every kingdom. Every kingdom. So this is a universal principle. This applies to any kingdom, political or spiritual is divided against itself is headed for destruction, okay? In other words, it's going to self-destruct if people are working against themselves in their own purposes and needs. Uh, for example, when you have massive divisions in a country, like in America or like in other countries, the country begins to implode. It begins to self-destruct. Uh, we're seeing this at work here. So, I mean, this is, this is a generally true principle. Um, until people can actually get along and agree on some basic common ground, you're going to have the country begin to self-destruct. Same thing here. To assume that he was working in opposition to his own kingdom by casting out demons is illogical. Now, <clears throat> we're going to get into this a little bit later. Well, wouldn't, could Satan have sacrificed one demonic possession? Here's the problem. This isn't one demonic possession. Yeah, that's what happened here. This is Jesus' entire ministry that's really under critique here. And he's been casting out demons left, right, and center. And so it doesn't make sense uh, for, for the devil to basically go and cast out every demon in Israel Um that's not going to bring people to the devil. That's going to bring people to God. Okay, so, you, you know, we've, we've got some issues here with this idea. It's totally illogical, especially in the context of his whole ministry. And again, he's not doing the work of Satan. Why? Because he's in opposition to the devil. He's fighting the devil at every step of this thing. Okay, uh, if, he, if he weren't, he would be sinning and doing a whole bunch of other stuff. But no, that's not what's going on. He's sinless, and he is casting out demons and healing people, bringing about a taste of the Messianic kingdom. Now, in verse 27, Jesus notes that the Pharisees and their sons, which means their disciples in this case, also conducted exorcisms. And if, if, if someone's simply going to say, oh, well, you're casting out demons by demons, and that's how you do it, then, well, how are, how are your disciples, how, how are the Pharisees' disciples casting out demons? I, you could just say the same thing, well, you're casting out demons too by the spirit of demons. And so what he says is, um, that the, your sons, your disciples, are going to claim, no, if you're casting out demons, it's got to be by God's power. Their own sons would condemn them, not physical, biological sons, but most likely their disciples would condemn them because, again, they're casting out demons too by the power of God. <clears throat> and so this is fascinating. In verse 28, Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God. So here's this, again, this emptying of oneself, this uh, not using the power of God, if you will, as a man, uh, but he's doing this how? He's driving them up by the Spirit of God. By the power of the Holy Spirit is how he's doing this. Okay, then the kingdom of God has come to you. How can someone enter a strong man's house and steal his possessions? Okay, so what's going on here? <clears throat> the power of Christ on earth in this time lay in his endowment of the Holy Spirit. This happened when the Holy Spirit came to him at the time of baptism, prior to his entry into public ministry. Okay, Jesus is truly a Spirit-filled servant of God. And to attack his work is to attack the Spirit of God who worked through him. Basically, any attack on Jesus is an attack on the Holy Spirit, which is an attack on God in general. And if it's true that the Spirit is working through Jesus, then the kingdom of God truly has come. You're seeing a taste of the Messianic kingdom. The authority and power and source behind Jesus is God. And to accuse him of anything else would be blasphemy. And so they are the ones blaspheming against Jesus and God himself. 
And then finally, in the final verse here, we said, neither demon nor the ruler of demons could prevent his healing the blind and mute man. The servant of God, the Messiah, casts out Belzebul's servant and takes out his property. And so again, this is very key, is Satan is basically trying to claim these people to some extent. And so Jesus is basically kicking uh, the demons out and then taking these people back. And that's essentially what's going on in this verse. And this is actually the first part of two of the most important sections of scripture in the Gospel of Matthew. And the reason why is because this is the official rejection of the Jewish rulership of Jesus. And we're going to see this in the next sermon. In this sermon, we get the encounter. We get where they try to attack him. And what's really going to draw the line here? They attribute the literal works of God to demons. They blast him against the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit is the one who is empowering this, who's doing this, and they are basically telling the Holy Spirit that he's evil. It is basically what's happening. So this is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. And they, they literally are seeing the works of God manifest among them. They're saying, now they're demonic. Now, let's talk about exposition. So what are the purpose of miracles in the ministry of Jesus? And we've talked about this before, but I think it's really important here to see. Um, it's not to turn people to faith. If it was, there wouldn't have been any questions that people would have just come to faith at this point. But what happens when miracles are done? Well, they're questioned. They're, they're, they are, uh, you know, they're seen with suspicion. Is it demonic? Okay, so they're not to turn people to faith. That's not what miracles do. And this has implications for modern evangelism. Some people say, well, we do power evangelism. We do evangelism by miracles and proclamation of the gospel. And I would say, well, people are getting saved if you're preaching the gospel, but miracles is not what's doing it. Um, again, the miracle part of it has nothing to do with somebody's heart being changed. And that's very important to see. Otherwise, we begin to think that it's on us to get someone saved, which is not true. God is the one who's going to do it. We're just messengers. So what are the purposes of miracles of Jesus? Well, the first was to fulfill scripture. As we noted in Isaiah 35, 5, that when the Messiah came, he would do abundant miracles left, right, and center. So we have to understand that these miracles were prophesied. Okay, these miracles were prophesied. The Messiah would be known by these miracles. Now, in that note, or on that note, we should also understand that we shouldn't be expecting the miracles of Jesus in that level of concentration apart from him elsewhere in history. Why? Because those were specifically marks of the Messiah. Somebody else could easily claim to be the Messiah if he were able to do those things. Second purpose is to demonstrate that Jesus was the Messiah. Okay, so there's this fulfillment of scripture portion, right? So that all the scriptures would be fulfilled. Then there's the mark that he is the Messiah himself. The third purpose is to demonstrate a taste of the kingdom. So again, when the Messiah is here, you would expect the kingdom to be here. Well, how is that going to happen in a still fallen world? Miracles, that's the point. You would have mass miracles, miracles of resuscitation, bringing people back from the dead, miracles of, of uh, healings and demonic demon stuff being cast out and, and people being able to see and hear and talk and things like that. So you get a taste of the kingdom because the king is actually present, so you know what it is you're looking forward to. Now, the second uh, theme that comes out here is the hardness of the hearts of the people. Again, it did not matter how many miracles were done. It did not matter. It's not even going to matter when Jesus is resurrected. That's not going to matter. The bottom line is a hardened dead heart is a hardened dead heart. And it's fascinating because I was watching a, uh, <clears throat> I was watching a, a talk recently uh, where an atheist was talking about how there are people who are uh, essentially... Um, uh, unresistant unbelievers, I think was what he said. Unresistant unbelievers. I may do a video about this at some point. Um, but the truth of the matter is, I don't believe there is such a thing as an unresistant unbeliever. If I present someone the gospel and they reject it, they have just resisted the gospel. They've resisted the power of the Holy Spirit. They, they've resisted uh, what God is giving them. And they might say, well, there's not enough evidence. Just give me enough evidence. Okay, it's not God's prerogative to give someone evidence on their demand. He has given us what he considers and what he has understood as enough evidence to, to believe, and people still reject. So again, I, I would argue that that's not the case, and I think that this demonstrates it. I think that it doesn't matter how much evidence you give somebody, they're not going to believe. Now, evidence is important uh, and for a number of reasons, including removing hurdles for people to hear the gospel, but evidence alone is not going to save people. Uh, additionally, it's really important to see uh, that the hardest the human heart is against Jesus, that ultimately, ultimately is really fighting against him. Okay? And the people are getting stirred up now, and the Pharisees are stirred up, and they want to kill him. There's really this, this attack on God. And whether people actively or passively engage in it, it's still there. And finally, for the third point of exposition, uh, the utility of Jesus' response. No house can work against itself. Uh, so this is really important, um, because we're in a time where Christianity is in a weird place. 
Christianity is in a very difficult and weird place. You, you got to remember, Christianity's always had little sects and, and things like that, etc. Denominations, things like that. Well, not always denominations, but you know, we we've dealt with this kind of stuff, right? You have a fairly unified church in Catholicism, but then you also have the Eastern Orthodox Church breaking away in 1000. You have the Protestant Reformation and things splinter. Um, but even within that, there was still a general consensus up into about, let's say about 1800s, 1850s, there was still a general consensus of what it meant to be a Christian, of what it meant to believe in Jesus, what it meant to uh, you know, have, uh, be, be saved. But what has happened since then is that has gotten massively splintered. And we're now seeing all sorts of Christianities that just don't resemble Scripture yet they do contain saved people. So we have this weird situation where, well, no house can work against itself, and, and we would look at other houses of Christianity, so to speak, and say, well, this seems to be working against Christianity a, a, as a whole. And the, the question is, is, well, is that really the case? Is that what's actually happening? Um, and it gets very hard to tell because we know in Scripture that it talks about how there's going to be heresies, there's going to be issues in the church. So we're going to address that more in the application section, but um, the bottom line is no house can work against itself. If, if a if a house of Christianity, if you will, truly is not Christian, it's going to destroy itself. <clears throat> and we've seen this. We've seen this in some of the larger denominations that have walked into liberal theology and their numbers just keep shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. Now for the Christocentric setting, we see Jesus as the Messiah and son of David in these verses. Again, they, they bring this up kind of out of nowhere. Is this the son of David? Uh, that really is the reference to the ruling king. It's a reference to the king who is coming. It's a reference to the political nature of the kingdom, where all of the nations are going to be under God, finally. So you're seeing that piece of it. You're seeing the miracles, which are going to indicate me as the Messiah and the fulfillment of Scripture. So it's pretty cool that you've got all of these things kind of coming together, and Jesus is bringing salvation, but the people are rejecting it. Now, in terms of application, let's take a look at the accusation of the Pharisees a little more in depth. So on one level, the argument does kind of work. You can sacrifice one player to win the war. In other words, well, maybe if Jesus just cast out one demon, oh, yeah, I'll let this demon go or whatever, you know, leave this person. I don't really want Satan or something like that. Then that could deceive the nation of Israel. But to literally purge demons from the nation of Israel for a period of time, which is basically what was happening, uh, would not work in Satan's favor. Uh, if anything, people are just going to come back to God, not him. So that's really key, that, that the argument does actually stand, because this is not just one demon, this is the entire ministry. <clears throat> However, Jesus again was kicking out demons left and right, dismantling this, quote, empire of evil. Now, I want to take a look then, given that, I want to take a look at both the end times and now. So in the end times, we have a situation where we can't trust miracles. Why can't we trust miracles in the end times? Uh, Satan, the, anar the Antichrist, and the false prophet are going to be performing them. This is, this is the problem. They're going to be performing miracles of various kinds. And in that time, believers are going to have to be heavily suspect of miracles that are not directly prophesied in Scripture. For example, the two witnesses. So in other words... Do miracles constitute working for God? Well, not necessarily, and that, that's sort of the problem, right? Uh, th th this is kind of the issue, is that miracles don't automatically constitute godly things. Uh, casting out demons, pretty hard for that not to constitute being for God. Uh, but this is, this is a serious issue, because in the end times you can't trust these things. What about now? So you have a slightly different situation now. We have a massive amount of people getting involved in these miracle movements, taking over the church, they're amassing political power and money. And they've been trying to do this for years. Like, they've been trying to do this in the 1800s, they've been trying to do this in the 1900s, and they're doing it in the 2000s. Like, this has not been a small thing. This has been systematic attempts to, to sway people under bad theology through the use of miracles, and it, it's a common theme in America. It's a very common theme in America. And these, these organizations are amassing political power and money. There's no doubt about it. And miracles are, are at the forefront of how the movement's dominating because it's very hard for people to see miracles and not think God is there. And this is the problem. Seeing things happen, hearing about things happen, you know, and then saying, well, God must be there. And we can get into the validity of those miracles. Some of them might be valid. Some of them might be not. We can get into if they're being stretched out or, or you know, if the spiritual aspects are, whether they're real or not. We could talk about that. But the big issue is that people are being drawn into these organizations because, quote, God's spirit is there, power is there, money is there, political power is there, influence is there, any number of things, except for good style of teaching, except for sound doctrine. Those aren't there. Those are not present. Sound doctrine and good teaching, those are not present. And so this is the problem that we have. 
So we have to use the teachings about false teachers to assess the validity of movements in the modern day. And what those teachings typically say is they say, don't look at the works they do, look at their fruit, which is of their lives, and look also at their doctrines and their teachings, because the doctrines and teachings will tell you if they're false teachers or not. And so with that, I'd like to conclude. Uh, the miracles of Jesus confirm that he is the Messiah and the Son of God. This demonstrates that Jesus was sent by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit. In modern times, miracles are not a valid test of truth for a religious movement. We are to continue to place the gospel and discipleship at the forefront of our churches and ministries. And now I'll close in prayer. Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for this time. We lift you up and exalt your name. God, we love you. And we wait for your return. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us at Spirit of Truth Church. Hope you have a wonderful day.